for joining us. Uh, my name is Grace, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jared, and we are both uh, researchers here at GitHub, and we're going to talk to you today about delight and how to measure it. So to start with, I wanted to talk about the difference between a good product and a great product. Recently, a friend of mine recommended that I buy something called Hay Clay uh, for my seven-year-old daughter, and I already have a bunch of this air-dry clay and she mostly just makes little worms out of it or little balls and she doesn't really use it. It kind of ends up all over the place. So I thought, why would I buy more of this stuff? Well, it turns out that Hey Clay actually comes with a really cool app where kids can follow along with really detailed instructions and make really cool things. And they actually do make really cool things. My daughter made monsters that looks exactly like the monsters you see here on the screen. And um, and I got an hour of quiet time out of it. So, you know, delight all around. Both both of these products are, you know, essentially just clay, but one was able to differentiate itself and go from being a good product to a really great product by inserting this thoughtful extra layer that led to both her and my delight. So we're talking about delight today. Um, what even is delight? So Nielsen Norman, their definition of delight is any positive emotional affect that a user may have when interacting with a device or an interface. And here I have a, a picture uh, done by one of our designers here, Gloria, of Mona's room, where she adds all of these tiny little details and makes this really delightful illustration. So there are two different main types of delight. Uh, one is called surface delight, which is these local and contextual uh, elements. And it usually stems from interactions with features. So that could be things like animations, microcopy that maybe it injects some humor or some slang, beautiful imagery or sound interactions. And then we have what we call deep delight. And this is more holistic and it's actually achieved once all of a user's needs are met. Delightful moments fulfill our emotional needs. So we have a picture here of an emotional wheel. To create these delightful moments, we need to actually understand the context of our customers as well as what emotions they are experiencing. And delight only occurs after those basic user needs are achieved. So once your product or your feature or your app is functional, reliable, and usable, only then can you achieve also making it pleasurable and delightful. And why do we care about creating products that delight our customers? Uh, well, delight leads to engaged and loyal customers. It establishes an emotional connection with customers and reminds them that there are real humans behind the design. So if you think about after experiencing a delightful moment, what do you do? You, do you tell someone about it, maybe recommend it to a friend? maybe look into what else that company offers. Um, this person who tweeted, they actually took an open source design from our own Martin Woodward and 3D printed a really cool neon Octocat design at home. And how does GitHub think about Delight? I will pass it off to Jared, who's gonna walk us through how we think about it. Thanks. So GitHub is well known for having great brand design and is well known for having a terrific mascot who is well loved. But delight is at GitHub is a lot more than just the great brand design. For example, it also includes surprising our customers by anticipating their needs and how they'll work to make sure that we can provide a system that continue that they can continue to love. For example, when we wanted to improve work tracking and issues. We built up what's great about markdown and slash commands to make work tracking faster and more flexible and better aligned with how our customers work now. Similarly, for our product like Sponsor that enables developers to make an open source software development into a career, this is a great example of how GitHub can drive the deep delight that we really want to strive to accomplish through our products. But how do you measure delight? 
Apple is well known for having excellent customer experience, and it ranks among the best for customer satisfaction for personal computers and consumer electronics. And one way that Apple accomplishes this is by taking advantage of uh, Net Promoter Score or NPS scores. This is a score of how likely a measure. This is a measure of how likely it is for someone to recommend a product or brand to a friend or a family member, and they measure it at multiple different points to really understand the broader experience. Well. NPS is useful and value, valuable in some ways. It also does have some specific drawbacks. So one of the advantages of NPS is that it's easy to understand and it works across a variety of areas and covers a, a pretty broad swath of customers' experience around a product or service. But in, in contrast to that, because it's so broad, it's difficult to really know what customers are actually responding to, which makes it less actionable than maybe you would like. And even though it's a measure of adoption, because it's not targeted at customers who aren't using your product, you don't really know what you can actually do to make sure that you're continuing to appeal to a broader swath than just the people that are already using your tools or services. So while we think NPS is useful, we want to discuss some ways that you can make it a more holistic approach to delight customers throughout the design process. Yeah, so one way to measure delight is to also think about emotional drivers within the jobs to be done framework. And this is a great thing to think about early in the design process when you're sort of in this more foundational space. If you're not familiar with jobs to be done, it's essentially this idea that people buy products and services to get a job done. The job statement is what the customer is ultimately trying to achieve or accomplish. Um, a classic example of this is that someone is not necessarily trying to drill a hole in the wall, they're trying to hang a picture. And they could employ multiple different tools or methods to get that job done. Jobs are functional, but they also have emotional aspects and components to them. So emotional jobs to be done uh, have both a personal dimension and a, a social dimension. How a customer feels about a solution is that personal dimension. And then the social dimension is how a customer believes that he or she is being perceived by others while using that solution. So how can you measure emotions in this way? So what we recommend doing is starting out by mapping out what a customer is doing and feeling and include their context in this customer journey map. This is ideally uh, content that comes from qualitative interviews or talking to customers. And mapping out the journey in this way helps you identify customer emotions, but also their highs and lows. It shows you where the journey has low points. And these could be opportunities where you can alleviate friction and maybe even create delight. Once you've identified those emotions that you want to encourage, as well as the emotions that you want, to avoid, you can start measuring these feelings with things like Likert scale questions. And you can ask these questions either in surveys or in interviews with people. So after this formative research, um, then you might start thinking about evaluating your concepts. And Jared's gonna go over one way to evaluate a concept, which is the Kano method. One way that delight is measured is through the Kano method, and the system was developed by Professor Kano at the Tokyo University of Science. The goal was to measure brand loyalty based on customers' emotional response to specific features. And the way that it works is that you ask customers how they would feel if a product did or didn't have a specific feature. And then based on their response to those two questions, you can understand how that will drive their emotional response to the product more broadly. So for example, if a customer said, that the feature was a basic was a something that they would expect to have and that if they didn't have it they would be very angry then you can expect that that's a basic requirement and something you need to include so in contrast if it was something that they didn't expect that it would have but it would be something that they would really enjoy having then that's a pro that's a feature that is a delighter and so by thinking about how you can balance different products in terms of the requirements and the delighters you can make sure that you have a product that balances those to have a more successful emotional response from your customers. Volcano is useful for evaluating concepts. 
Once the product ships, you want to make sure that you're still hearing from your customers and are continuing to improve your products. So while a product is in private beta or public beta, we like to use a system called DOOF to evaluate how the product is matching customers' expectations. So DOOF stands for Delight Utility, Usability, and Product Market Fit. And it's a framework that's based on the academic literature around product adoption. And it allows us to understand how customers respond to a product sort of broadly. Essentially, we ask um, through a survey generally, customers to say how likely they are or how they would feel if a, they were unable to use the product anymore. The kind of a classic product market fit question. And then based on their response to that, we categorize them as either being supporters, neutral, or detractors for a product. We also ask them if the product delights them, how useful it is, and how usable it is. And based on those, we can see if a product is something that it, we can, how we can improve the product to make sure that we're moving customers from being sort of neutral about the product to being stronger supporters of it. And this really helps you understand how you should balance making updates to the product versus rolling out new features and which customers are really going to respond to that and how. So it's been a useful framework by and large for making sure that we're driving delight in our products, even after they're no longer uh, in the lab, so to speak, but are out in the wild. In conclusion, it's important to ensure that you're delighting your customers if you want to have loyal, engaged customers. And to do this, you need to be thinking about delight throughout the product life cycle, as well as also through the broader brand and identity work that you, that you as a design team will do. We've laid out how GitHub approaches this, but we're sure that there's other ways that this could be approached. We're going to share some resources, including uh, the details for how we uh, deploy Duff surveys so that people can see a little bit more of the inner workings of our process. We'd love to continue the conversation about Delight and customers and how we can continue to make sure that we're meeting the customer's high standards and delighting them by focusing on this important element throughout the entire product lifecycle. So thank you very much for uh, watching our talk and we really appreciate your input and look forward to hearing from you. Thank <music> you.